Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this next segment of this week's study. As we return to this document, document number seven, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance? There's much that we yet need to understand as to how we can present and how we can explain that which we are needing to explain to the world. So should we ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, together we come before you and we thank you for the many blessed things that you have been providing. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the way that we have treated others. Forgive us of taking on burdens that we should never have taken upon ourselves. As we start today, for many of us, we lay our plans at your feet to be taken up or laid aside as you so direct. Direct us now as we open this study. We pray that the Holy Spirit may enlighten our minds, guide our conversation. We pray for your angels to attend us and show us that which we need and the protection that we require, Father. I thank you for each one that has come to this study. I thank you for those that will view this study later. Help us now, guide us in all things so that we may draw closer to you. For this, we thank you, and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now we recognize that the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are to be studied together. We're not to study these things separately. So as Glenn had continued here, the book of Daniel cannot be studied alone. There are several things to consider when applying this principle. As we have already noted, it was a careful application of Miller's rules to both Daniel and Revelation, especially that enabled our pioneers to accurately fix their position in prophetic time. Since then, we know that the prophetic time is no longer, and knowing that, we cannot base any following prophetic interpretations on time. Now, there's been quite a bit that I have addressed in conversation with Glenn and with others where they want to be very, very, very direct about what a mistake July 18th of 2020 had been. However, we've come to the understanding that July 18th of 2020, in a way, is very much like October 22nd, 1844. And this is not something that has been easily accepted by either Glenn or some of these others that I've talked with. Well, it's interesting that some of the opponents of our time setting bring up the exact same verses and the same objections that the opponents of the Millerites brought up regarding October 22nd, 1844. Right. You know, we cannot know the times of the seasons. No man know at the day or the hour, you know. So these these same types of objections would have, of course, applied to the Millerites in their time setting. Now, the objection can be, well, there was actually prophetic periods that ended, but yet Christ seems to be quite clear that there are things that we cannot know, and one is the second coming, which is what they were predicting. Now, of course, right. these periods didn't predict the second coming, right? And um, so, you know, the question is, because, you know, I'm opposed to time setting, I was opposed all the way through, except that we were led to these dates. And so we have to do something with them, right? So we had a date, and and the question was, well, what does this date possibly mean? And in the context of how we had drawn out the lines, the there was evidences that, that this would point to regarding the prediction of Nashville, which I believe that God in his providence led us to give a warning to Nashville. And just as there was a warning to the world about Christ coming, and yet did Christ come in that period of time? It's been a long time since 1844. Right. So the fact is what will what has been prophesied regarding Nashville will occur. We just had the correct date, as the Millerites did. They had the correct date, but they placed the wrong event on that date. 
And, and because we can't know the day or the hour, right? That is, we can't know the events that are going to fall. Does it mean that time has, has no purpose, right? Time has a purpose, but it's not seen until after the fact. And that's the thing that we've learned quite clearly. We can't predict, uh, even if we have a date, what event is going to fall on that date, if any. But it doesn't mean that that date is insignificant if scripture points to it. Agreed. Excuse me. The, the situation that we have here right now is one that we need to keep in mind because we cannot afford a surface study or a surface understanding of what is being stated. Now, while we are all aware of what Mrs. White has said regarding time and prophetic interpretations, July 18th, 2020 was an event that while it may not have occurred as it had been addressed, it is still a waymark for which we have found multiple validations. Yeah, now, and, and that creates a bit of a problem, though. I mean, one of the problems is we know that, you know, we have this date and it has something to do with our movement. And yet, you know, we there's people outside of this movement that that date's not going to mean anything to. It's not going to mean anything to them. So yet there are ways in which we can show the significance of the date, even to people who aren't part of this movement. But that, that becomes a little bit tricky. We're not really sure how that's all going to work out or what, you know, how that's going to be seen by others. But we, we can't deny the date just because, you know, we don't understand its purposes completely. And, and I understand that people, you know, who were supporting the date now are just abandoning it altogether as an error. But you see this, as, as you pointed out, as we have studied out, how is this different from what occurred with the Millerites in 1844? It's, it's no different. That's the point. So it, It's quite amazing. The parallel. The, the, the parallel has been absolutely spot on. It has been incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, the prediction of Josiah Litch of the fall of the Ottoman Empire on August 11th, 1840 was the last literal time prophecy to be ful fulfilled here on Earth as an observable event, identifying the close of the second woe. Now, would we agree or disagree w with this sentence from all that we have studied? I will tell you my opinion and my position. I would say that from what we have studied, especially bringing William Foy's portions into this, that this is not a correct statement. Okay, so um, explain that a little bit. Just which which point? Well, that he believes that this is identifying the close of the second woe. Wasn't Foy very direct, even in as late as 1843, that the second woe had not yet done sounding? Okay, okay so yeah, so you, so the second woe ends, but the sixth trumpet still sounds. Okay. So, so when we know when the fifth trumpet sounds, it's not the beginning of the first woe, because the fifth trumpet's going to sound depending on which date you have, you know. 607 or different dates that are chosen, but it's going to be dealing with Muhammad, right? That you're going to have the sixth, the fifth trumpet sound. But then the first woe isn't going to be, begin until 1229, right? Okay. Okay. So, so then you have that, that first woe. And when the first woe ends, uh, the second woe begins right, because they're following one after the other, and the sixth trumpet sounds at the beginning of the second woe. So the assumption that was made is that when the second woe ends, the sixth trumpet ends and the seventh trumpet begins to sound. So we know that the sixth trumpet continued to sound even after the end of the second woe. And then you have the seventh trumpet sound, 
October 22nd, 1844. But you don't have the third third woe arrive yet, right? Correct. So you so you do, so the woes occur within the trumpets, but they're not the same. So we have the the seventh trumpet has been sounding since October 22nd, and on September 9th, the third woe begins. Now, and it, it also begins with a restraint, just as the first woe began with a restraint. The second woe began with a loosening and ended with a restraint. So my understanding is that we have this restraint of Islam on s- September 11th, but Islam will be loosed at some point in connection with the events at the end of the world. Exactly how that occurs, I don't know. Does that, that help? I think it's very clear. Now, but he does say some things here that that are um, so he says that uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire on August 11th, 1840, was the last literal time prophecy to be fulfilled here on Earth. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means by a literal time prophecy, uh, because obviously it's symbolic, just as the other time prophecies are. So I'm not sure what he means by that. Just like an event that we can see, maybe that's what he's referring to. But, uh, I mean, the 1335 we can see as an event. That's the first disappointment. Even the 2300 days, that's the great disappointment. Those are events. Do you know what he means? Well, do I know what he's trying to state here? No. Do I see the influence of Uriah Smith? Yes. Do I see the influence of others? Yes, but okay. do I see the the basis in biblical study line upon line? No. Yeah. So, so when people write in this, so if I'm going to say something, I'm going to say it. Generally, right? I okay. mean, sometimes you know, if somebody asks me if it was a good meal, I might, you know, sort of talk around it or change the topic if it wasn't that enjoyable, you know, or I might point out something that I enjoyed about the meal, you know. But, you know, when when I'm communicating in, in Scripture, I'm not going to imply something. I, I don't think that that's, that's a biblical approach. That is, if somebody has something to say, they need to say it, and they need to have support in saying it. So I find that people, you know, uh, skirt around issues when they don't really have good arguments, right? That is, they set up things, they imply things, they use. uh, It's a type of manipulation as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I I don't know what you think about that. And what, because you say there's things behind what he's saying, there's influences, but he's not just telling us straight out what he thinks about different things, which which he should. If he, I mean, Who's his audience here anyway? Like, who's he writing to? Like, who's who does he think is reading this, or who is he trying to reach? Do you know? He is trying to reach other Adventists first, okay. primarily. So not, with, so not people who've been in the movement before. So he's writing to just general Adventists. Correct. Okay. And so in, but but if he's got this this. So there must be some way, though, in which he's, I don't know, because he's addressing things that generally Adventists wouldn't, like there's an undercurrent here that Adventists wouldn't pick up on. Correct. Right. So is he trying to defend himself in some ways when he's presenting to other Adventists that he's trying to make himself appear reasonable and yet presenting things that they might disagree with? I know it's a hard question to answer. Well, okay. As one of the five that were disfellowshipped at Newport, Mm -hmm. and the only one of the five that sought a manner to try to be reestablished as a church member, and yet decided to not go forward. Okay, so so originally you're saying he, he was disfellowshipped and 
he wanted to to be reestablished as a church member, but then he changed his mind. Is that what you're kind of saying? It was it was said to him that this is not something that is going to occur. That's not something that I said to him. Of, of the five, one has passed to his grave. One has moved <clears throat> to a, a fairly remote portion of the central U.S., Two have agreed to never again speak of the seven times or anything having to do with the movement on church property, yet they are still known as being those 2520 people. Yeah, you can de definitely never remove that tag. Right. It, it's always going to lead to suspicion. I mean, that's the, my problem with the relationship with the church in July 18 is it's like, well, nobody's ever going to trust you again, even if that person says they trust me. And they, they maybe even agree with some what I say. There's just too much suspicion. They, they Never can I really be accepted within the church. Well, the issue... even, if I, even if I renounced everything, there would still always be this air of suspicion. Right. Which is. <laughs> yeah. Of all of those that were disfellowshipped of the five, mm -hmm. he is the only one that never was allowed to speak for himself. He what do you mean not, not allowed to speak for himself? Okay. The church chose to have the meeting regarding the issues seen on a specific date. On that date, Glenn was in Alaska on a job site. The expectation of the church was that you're going to abandon your job. You're going to fly back down to the U.S. You're going to defend yourself. And then if you choose to go back to your job, that's your problem. So since he was not willing to abandon his job to come back down for this meeting, a straw man was put before the church to speak on Glenn's behalf. Yet what Steve Wahlberg did is he presented things in a light that showed how Glenn was so totally wrong in how he believed so that Glenn would be disfellowshipped. Hmm. This is one of the reasons that has led me to my frustration in anything that Steve Wahlberg has to say or do. Yeah. Well, and it's pretty scary stuff in a way, but also, you know, trying to understand, you know, who Glenn's writing to what, I mean, when, when I write, I usually have some kind of audience in mind. Now I know right. people who aren't going to understand my stuff when I put it online are going to read it. Like they're not part of this movement. Right. But I generally write, to to people like like I'm not going to explain all the basic stuff every time I write a paper no uh, to every person right so that means some people are going to read my paper they're not going to understand what it's about and that's fine so they're just not going to continue reading it though there's hundreds and hundreds of people who read my papers on a regular basis they have no idea who they are or what they understand about them but they you know they will constantly read you know papers on Josiah Litch's prophecy over and over, right? So they download them, they read them, you know, we can see how many pages they read, things like that. So with, with Glenn putting this out here, is he trying to, is he trying to placate people? Is he trying to vindicate um, his position in front of other people that may have known him? Is that part of it? Or is it just, Completely to just write to regular Adventists and nothing to do with his past or who he is. Or you understand I, what believe I'm he's, I believe he's trying to write to Adventists that have not chosen to study. And he mm. wants to try to make specific points of history become relevant for them. Okay. So, um, yeah. So... I mean, obviously, when you're when you can like if I'm going to be presenting to Adventists, which I've done, you know, people who weren't part of this movement when I was in Australia, I did that. 
you know, obviously I, I'm not going to tell them everything, right? But I'm going to be pretty open and honest about what happened, my position with the church. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, sort of say, here's the controversy in which, you know, I was involved. And here is why I believe certain things. And I'm going to show them things that Adventists, if they're reasonable, would accept. Like you go to the story of Joseph, you can clearly see, well, there's this structure here, right? Or, you know, you go to the story of, of Ezra and the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem and, and the beginning of the 2300 days. You know, so when you start looking at some of these things, the re you, you know that they're not going to understand all of the issues, right? They're, they're just, they're not. So in, okay. and you have a group of people, you know, some of them might know some things about the movement, like when I was in Australia, some of the people, you know, they knew Terry Lambert, right? And Tess. And, uh, some of the people didn't, right? Some, some weren't even Adventists. But there's always going to be, you know, I guess the question in in reading something that somebody's writing, I mean, there is an under an undercurrent that exists in all writing, right? There's there's a background, and that person is choosing to give you some information and not other information, right? I do the same thing. We all do that, right? We can't tell everybody everything, and and you're trying to give the information in a way that the person you know, first they can understand it, right? That they can comprehend what you're saying, but also that they that they can receive it, right? You're not going to present it in a way that they're not going to be interested in it or think that it's valid, right? But you're saying here that there is, you know, this whole issue of time setting, that there is, that he's addressed, that, and that's not something that he did, right? But the you know the movement did later, and that's still kind of in this paper in a sort of uh, a something in his mind that he's addressing. So he must be addressing to some degree those who have been involved in time setting. It's that's... it's a point that's that's very fixed in his mind in the conversations that we've had. His position is that I am willfully ignoring the situation that prophetic time is no longer and that by involvement in the situation with July 18th of 2020, I am choosing to set aside scripture and that what I am stating has been entirely wrong and is not worthy of consideration. Okay. Now, so he had you read this, right? He He's asked me multiple times to go through his documents. I went through numbers 8, 9, and 10, as we, as we covered before. Mm -hmm. When I've gone through these and read them, there's just a lot of what I see as non sequiturs, where mm -hmm. he makes a point but does not really follow the point through. Yeah, it comes to conclusions that aren't really connected with the evidences or line of reasoning that he's presented. Now, in a similar way, when we went through all of this with Uriah Smith, mm -hmm. there were multiple points that Smith had made that I found that I would I would have trouble agreeing with. Yet there are many in this area that are very focused that Smith was a prophet as Ellen White was a prophet and that we should take every word that, that Smith has presented as if this was directly from God, because of course this book was endorsed as God's helping hand. Yeah. So I guess the point that I'm getting to, because when I, when I'm, Dealing with people, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to tear them down. I'm trying to understand them. Correct. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is it that this person doesn't see, and what could what could be said to help them? Now, I don't know what Glenn would think of our discussions that we've had regarding this paper. He might he might take it as an attack. You know what we've we've done. I don't know, but you know, definitely it's not. I mean, we're being 
were being fairly critical of the papers, right? In that, you know, there's problems with them. But, you know, we all have our problems in, in how we think and in how we communicate. We're not all perfect in any sense. But I think the one thing that I would say is that he doesn't really seem to be aware of, well, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, right? That is, we sometimes think we know things that we don't. We think we understand a situation. And, and the one thing that's pretty clear is that there's so much information that he's missing and that he needs to consider, but you're saying that he's unwilling to consider. Is like he's... is. Would he ever read any of my papers, for instance, if you gave them to him? I don't know. The yeah. you know the the point here is I've gone in some of the studies. I hit, I've been very open about how I'm taking an adversarial position with some of the positions that he is taking mm -hmm. because I want to engage with others i want i want to see what other people are seeing about what he is mm -hmm. having to say yeah you're kind of checking to say you know i see this do you guys see the same thing right yeah. now well similar when when jeff started writing you know and i just couldn't believe that what he was saying in his articles like it just didn't seem like Jeff. So I wanted other people's opinions. Do you, do you, do you see what I see? You know? Well, I, I, I have been a little surprised yesterday. I had a day where I was, I was driving quite a bit mm -hmm. and I have been monitoring to see what presentations he has been making. Now I stumbled upon one that, he had had put out i believe it was on the on the 10th of august i could be wrong i that that could be the right day mm -hmm. i was surprised that it was a three and a half hour presentation because a lot of what he's recently been doing have been you know 90 minute presentations and there's some things that he said that have been very you know very much on point and then there's times that using his own words that he has been a very loose cannon. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, in this situation, I've listened. I've found things that I, I definitely do not agree with. I've found some things that have made me shake my head because if Elder Jeff had been monitoring these studies, I think he would have seen some things that would have surprised him. Mm -hmm. Now, the comment from the chat, and I'll read it directly. I think dismissing Ellen White, as well as the 2520s, 718 of 20, and any similar controversies is mostly because many people don't want to apply themselves to study and to face the flaws and sins in their lives that need to be corrected and forsaken. I know that applies with me. <laughs> I was just going to say, really, that applies with all of us, right? Well, and I, and so that's something in human nature that that we've recognized is the part of part of the problem that we're facing all the time is truth. Truth is not um, it's not a friend to sin, you know. So. So the, the struggles that we face sometimes in understanding has to do with really what's going on inside of us. And, that, and that's the important thing, I think, when, when I look here, because, like, as you say, first, you have a reaction to what he's saying. And then you try to decide, is this something in me that's reacting to him or or is this something that's real? Right. Right. OK. And. And so when we're studying other people's material that we disagree with, or even people material we agree with, we need to be to be aware of why we take the positions we do. And and why we especially if we have some kind of emotional reaction to a person or what they're saying, 
we really need to take a long, hard look at ourselves. Because it's really easy just to sort of say, this person is wrong and, and, and look at the flaws. But we're trying to find truth here. Like we're trying to examine this to examine ourselves, not really to examine him. And then in examining ourselves, then we can find ways to help other people, right? Such as Glenn, right? That, that, right. Does that make sense? No, it does. That, that's the way that I've always approached communicating with people. You know, going back to my dad when I was a kid, you know, trying to communicate with somebody it was impossible to communicate with. You know, I, I recognized, you know, first is I could have just blamed my dad and said my dad's an idiot or something like that. But, you know, I loved him. You know, and uh, so, you know, I wanted to communicate with him. And and as I became a Christian and, and understood more about uh, sin and as I understood more about my dad and, and what he had been through, it helped me in my relationships with other people. So. You know, when I do have relationships with people, they're they're fairly intense. That is, I'm not really good at superficial relationships, you know, just like social relationships that don't mean anything. I, I try to connect with people, whether it's guitar students or whatever. I want to be able to communicate to them important ideas. Right. Okay. Agreed. You know, they're not always the theological ideas, but they're but they're values that that we have so how we treat people how we how we talk to them how we deal with their emotions how we deal with you know if they're frustrated with us in some way how we deal with them all these things are really really important and those to me are the most important things the intellectual understanding that we have is is just part of it's it's a tool that we have i guess in a way to connect to God and to connect to one another. And I'm not saying it very well, but hopefully you get the point. So, I mean, it's obviously a, a lot of an aside of from what he's actually talking about here. So we're trying to look at this, this undercurrent of what's, what's occurring. But I, I think it's important to know that, that, um, that people are, you know, their views that we have, all of our views that we have, they're, they're built on all kinds of different things. They're not just necessarily these intellectual arguments, right? And, and that's kind of what Angela is saying in her comment about, you know, when we, when we dismiss things like the 2520, when you have this attack that the church made back in Newport, that it wasn't really just about an idea. It was about control and power and fear and all these different emotions as well that people have about something that they don't know anything about. Right. So anyway, we, we can go out and read, but hopefully that's that's all makes sense to people. Okay. The 1335-year prophecy fulfilled in 1843 was the last time prophecy put in place concerning the daily as it served to confirm 508 as the starting point of the transition from paganism to papalism. On October 22nd, 1844, is the final day of prophetic time. This date, October 22nd, 1844, was the close of two great prophetic time periods combined, the 2300-year prophecy and the 2520-year prophecy. The first signaled the move by Christ from the holy place to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and the second showed the transition from the scattering to the gathering of God's people. In reviewing these things, it is important to realize that God does not leave his people in the dark concerning their place in history. Prophetic waymarks have simply switched from time to events. In other words, since October 22, 1844, we must ascertain our true position from the stream of events rather than the stream of time. Here again, with all that we have studied over the last three plus years, since July 18th of 2020, we have come to see a lot of situations, especially in regard to numbers, events, 
et cetera, as having more, I'll say this, um, as becoming more and more valuable as we choose to proceed in our studies. I'm, I, I look at this again as a very surface explanation. It's going to hit home possibly with some, but there's going to be those that are just going to set this aside and, and just decide not even to go forward because of of what we're what what's being addressed here. That's just my opinion. Okay, uh, just uh, another point because Stephen and I had a little discussion just regarding uh, Desmond Ford and his rejection of the 2300 days. What was the basis for it? What kind of arguments was, you know, he nitpicky about, you know, we don't know the starting point, um, you know, and then the fact that, uh, you know, he applied the 2300 days or the 2300 evening mornings to uh, a tie kiss epiphanies, even though you can't pinpoint this in any kind of detail, right? That is, they don't fit. Right. There's 1150 days that you can fit there in that chronology. And so, you know, they, they have a different standard. That is, Desmond Ford and these others had a different standard for their interpretation of prophecy than for Seventh day Adventists. Now, we have all of this witness, these witnesses to the 2300 days and the 70 weeks with the light that's come through this movement in its connection with Millerite history and in 457 BC, right? Right. Amazing detail that, you know, the church would benefit uh, in knowing, or scholars would if they would look at it, if they would (laughs) take the time to understand it. But yet when we look at here where he talks about these prophetic periods, where, where does he end the 1335? In 1843. So he doesn't end it on April 19th? No, he just using a a surface understanding and saying this takes it to 1843 is a year. Okay. Right. Yeah. So and then and then he's just going to say, well, October 22nd, there's two prophetic periods that end there, which we agree. And then from then on, we can never have time. Right. Now, does he accept the prophetic mirror or does he only accept Miller's 2520? I can't say if he has ever studied the prophetic mirror or anything that Hiram Edson had presented. Okay. Yeah. So because, I mean, if he accepted the prophetic mirror, you would see 1863 is, is not just an event, but it is a date. Correct. Not predicted ahead of time, date seen after the fact. Now, what about 1989? Again, one of the one of the main issues that he and I have had in our conversations. At one point, he accepted that September 11, 2001, on that date, that something had occurred that was relevant in the study of prophetic history okay well, so that's 9 11 but what about 11 9 he's 11 9 does not compute for him okay, okay. so he's not going to take uh daniel 11 verse 40 and have a and b a being 1798 and b being 1989 i would have to say no he's he's going to look at it that anything after october 22nd 1844 has no relevance whatsoever okay but but he says he believes in events i mean that's an event i agree I mean, and all all events occur on dates you and i are on the same page on that point when he told me that he was no longer going to agree with this regarding the relevance of september 11th 2001, it was an alarm for me. Mm. I've had other parties, other friends of long standing that are unwilling to look at that situation. I have one friend in particular with whom I spent time 
subsequent to September 11th, 2001, that is very adamant that they do not wish to believe anything that would have to do with the seven times, with September 11th, with any of this. It's just another day. Okay. So, so he says that we, we don't have time, but we have events. What, what events does he have then? Anything? Or when an event happens, it can't happen on a date? I don't know how to answer that question because this is, this is not a, a part of a discussion that he and I have had. Okay. Yeah, it would be, it'd be interesting to see what he says. I mean, I mean, because we have events on a line. So, I mean, if he's talking about events, but he has no line in which to put those events upon and no way to analyze those events, right? So the way that we look at it, at least the way I look at it, I think that we, we would agree, is that we have these events. We've never been able to predict an event as to the time. Right. And... um Yet when we look back at events, the dates are part of the analysis that confirms, not in, in the primary sense, but in, at least in the secondary sense, the relevance of those events, right? The primary sense would be uh, the order of events and how they go on a line and how they parallel a reform line, right? Okay. And then we have these witnesses, these analytical tools, that we we can then look at those dates and say, well, this is such an amazing coincidence that we have these events, they fall on such and such dates, and then, you know, we can see that those are significant, right? So, like, when we had July 18th, I mean, we had this date, nothing particular happened upon it, but 187 days later, you know, the School of the Prophets was sold for 18.7% below their asking price. Right. You know, or, you know, Jeff, uh, 1260 days after July 18, 2020, he, he repudiates, rejects uh, symbolic use of numbers, ironically, you know, 1260 days after. So, so we, can, we can use these things in that way. Now, some people think that we use the numbers to build the lines, so to speak, right? That is, um, the numbers are the primary things. And so they get confused. They see us with all these dates and numbers and think, oh, you're using these dates and numbers to create something. And in reality, it's just an analysis, right? Right. Okay. So anyway, so I don't know what he's doing if he's talking about events, because uh, events are going to happen on dates. And he's going to say, well, if an event does happen, that date will have no significance whatsoever prophetically. And that would be a denial of Palmoni. Agreed. Right? Because Christ has always demonstrated that there is numerical structure in everything in the entire universe is, is all math. So, I don't know. It's kind of interesting, um, the approach that people will take. <clears throat> in considering this transition from time to events, it is a set it is essential to understand precisely where this transition occurs in Daniel 11. Uriah Smith and others failed to make this transition and therefore attempted to place future events of both Daniel and Revelation into past prophecies that were based on time. It's, it, it's interesting the, the step that he's taking to try to defend his point. As we have already noted, by changing the word concerning the identity of the king of Daniel 11.36, he, in consequence, had to then change a word concerning the identity of the seven kings of Revelation 17.10. This seemingly simple mistake highlights the fact that Daniel and Revelation are one, and to alter or modify the one, will cause you to, in turn, to alter or modify the other. As we progress in the actual study of Daniel 11, we will be looking much closer at Uriah Smith's position, as it clearly shows that there is a definite line between present truth for his time and the present truth for our time. Okay, so none of this makes sense to me, what he's saying. 
So he makes some claims, which in what I've read in further on, he never proves, right? So he doesn't actually ever show us where this transition occurs in Daniel 11, right? He presents a thought, but he does not develop the thought. Yeah, never develops the thought. And then now I've still been trying to understand what he means, how that changing the word to acting, how that directly affects the seven kings in Revelation 17, 10, right? I've never been able to figure out what he, how that is connected. He doesn't explain that connection, right? Right, correct. So, I mean, obviously we can't read his mind, but the question is, and you're saying that this generally isn't how he communicates. This isn't how he thinks. So I wish I knew what was going on in his thinking process, like why thoughts aren't completed, why he makes statements, but never follows up. Is it that he didn't fully understand when he's writing through this, what his reasons were? He just had some kind of impression and he never can show it. You know, like sometimes we come up with ideas. I do all the time. And you think they're quite interesting or they might have some insight or some bearing on something. And then you drop it after a while because you realize it goes nowhere. You know, but you don't keep writing about it, you know, and presenting on it if you really know it goes nowhere. You know, so I would really like to know what it is he's saying and why he continued writing, even though he doesn't seem to have, like why he brings up these ideas. Like you'd think he would go through and edit this and just evaluate his own understanding in some, but he doesn't seem to be able to do that. I just find it really peculiar. It's quite fascinating, actually. I know when I, when I write something that I am hypercritical about what I write and the way in which I'm writing. Mm-hmm. And when I am, when I'm trying to write something out, I, I will take a good period of time to try to make sure that my point is relevant and well stated. Well, we do the best we can. I mean, obviously I, I recognize, you know, there's real limitations to writing a paper or talking or communicating, but you do the best you can. And, and, and definitely, you know, having ideas and saying, well, there's, here's this idea, but you never address it afterwards. Like now he says, it's what's the word it's essential. So this right. point that he brings up is essential. He never addresses. Correct. Which I, I just find pretty odd. Yeah. So it's just like you're talking, you're saying, this is the most important thing you need to understand and I'm going to explain it and you never explain it. You know, it could be, you know, when you're talking, you know, you get sidetracked onto some other topic, but he's got a paper, right? So he should know that this thing that he said is essential. He needs to demonstrate it somewhere in the following pages, which he doesn't. So I'm not even sure he knows what he's talking about. Well, you know, I've been through this kind of a situation before. In, in the time that I have been seeing and spending time with Jennifer, she has been very direct of her assessment with me because she said that I tend to take time to consider my words, but that I'm also very focused upon the necessity of clearly presenting the message of the three angels of Revelation 14. She has found it very strange that in one particular home church situation, that the party that owned this house, after a period of years, would call me up and say, you need to find a different place to worship. This is a three angels message house, and you don't believe in the three angels message. Now, this came after I had stood up to Emiliano because he had given a presentation on a particular Sabbath. He had made it, he'd made certain points very, very clear. 
as to what he believed. And I challenged him on one of those points. He stated, I will completely address this after we break for the fellowship meal. We broke for the meal. We had just general conversation. And then he and his family got in their truck and left. He never bothered to explain his point. I had a similar situation that occurred with another who came in and began to ask us to view a presentation <clears throat> that another person had given. And I came very specific with this person since he had been teaching for quite a while and asked him in front of the rest of the group, where is your second witness for this premise? And his direct comment to me was, I knew I was going to get hung upon this. We'll address this later. And that never happened. The third one had to deal with Don Frost. Now, in this case, I took time to pray with Don Frost. I took time to talk with him without having to say anything directly publicly, but I could not agree with many of the things that he was saying. And at that time, the owner of this house was believing that all three of these men were righteous in what they were presenting, even if they would not defend their positions. So I'm intrigued. I know Glenn, mm -hmm. but I am seeing many things in this presentation in all of these in, in all of these where he makes a statement about how he is going to go further in depth and he's having a problem supporting what he's stating yeah so i mean it, i mean there's the fact is that errors is um it's impossible to defend error right mm -hmm. When you when you have truth, it's easy to show arguments for truth, right? Because in a sense, truth is kind of self-evident. You can you if you if something is in the Bible, you can show lots of scriptures for it. Now sometimes people don't want to see it because you know they have a very narrow view of what what it is they think you're presenting, and and you know so some people say, well, I don't see those words in scripture, you know investigative judgment nowhere in the bible does it talk about an investigative judgment right though the idea is there it's pretty clear there's a pre-advent judgment but uh you know when people when people have these ideas like what i don't understand like to me there should be a purpose in what he's saying and what i can't figure out is his purpose like why he's making these claims and then never following up I mean, because I don't think it's intentional on his part. I don't think he's trying to be uh, deceptive or manipulative in any way. Is it just that people's thinking isn't clear because they're confused? Okay, that's a possibility. You know, once, once you reject light, then your thinking starts to become clouded and confused. I know my sister-in-law, when she left Adventism, she was an Adventist for a while, and... Uh, you know, I had some of her books and she would write lots of notes in her books. And I brought this up to her and I said, what did you mean when you wrote this here in, in this book in the margin? She says, I have no idea. I don't remember anything of what I used to believe. You know, yeah. And, and I've had that happen with other people, too, who had been Adventists and left the truth. And they they couldn't even tell you what they used to think. So maybe there's some of that going on in a rejection of light. The person's mind becomes clouded and they can't they can't think rationally. But, you know, I know some people who've rejected the truth. They can. Well, they usually are deceptive. Right. So uh, they might be able to think clearly. Uh, and, and, and I have to assume that they're lying uh, just because they know what they're saying is not true. 
right? So often I've seen people who were Adventists and they will completely misrepresent what Adventists believe as an attack against Adventism. And they know that no Adventist would think those things. I shouldn't say no Adventist, maybe there are some somewhere, but you know, it's not generally what Adventists would think. Um, they'll take Ellen White quotes. They know she doesn't mean that. They will, um, you know, like they'll take it out of context and out of everything that she said. And you can clearly see she's not saying what they're claiming that, you know, the error that she has, right? You would think they would just be able to pick up on real errors, right? But instead they have to create errors. Right. So, I mean, we're trying to, to study this because we want to learn something, something about ourselves, and, and something about this message. And and I think this is profitable, but this is, it, in a sense, it's kind of painful going through this, these papers. Right. right. Like, I would want to be able to read something that somebody's written and say, wow, that's a really interesting, you know, what they're presenting and, and this is truth and, you know, they have good arguments for it. But I haven't seen any of that in, in these papers at this point. Yeah, the the points need to be better developed. Well, or even just developed at all. Right. Well, okay. Yeah, Angela says that the amnesia and confusion is stumbling around in the darkness when we don't yield to the Holy Spirit's influence. And I believe that's true. I've seen it with people. Okay, so the next paragraph there. As we have noted, the translators of the King James Bible have already done the work of translating the words from the ancient languages to English. Bearing that in mind, we do not need to keep retranslating those languages, but need to simply have a correct understanding of the English words that are employed. As words have changed in their meaning through the years, this dictionary brings us back to the original intent of the meaning of each word expressed in English. It is interesting to note that the same problem existed for the same reason with the Hebrew language. Yet even here was evidence of the sin of Israel. Through the intermarriage of the people with other nations, the Hebrew language had, been, had become corrupted, and great care was necessar necessary on the part of the speakers to explain the law in the language of the people that it might be understood by all. Certain of the priests and Levites united with Ezra in explaining the principles of the law. They read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Prophets and Kings 661.3. So page 661, paragraph 3. Though it cannot be proven that our pioneers used this dictionary, it was the one that was in play during their lifetime. Unlike other dictionaries, this particular one often uses scripture to define the meaning of a word. Just as God has placed a guard around the translation of his word, so he has placed a guard around the definition of our English words. Well, why not accept the Oxford Dictionary that was in use at the time that the King James Bible was published? And... It also uses um, scriptural references as well. Exactly. Like have, uh, the complete Oxford English Dictionary. And, and they use all kinds of biblical references uh, because they use for every definition. So it's it was, uh, I think, originally in like 20 volumes, big volumes, but I have it at the compact edition. So it was one volume with nine pages per uh, page. Right. Mm -hmm tiny print. <laughs> you have to use a magnifying glass to read it. I, I used it in a Scrabble game once. It's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, the, the and, point... Anyway, boxing, boxing is a word, by the way. Um, uh, but <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, you could say that there's another dictionary that can, can be used. Now, Webster published his own uh, uh, King James Version in 1833. Okay. Right, so the Webster's uh, King, which I have on an e-sword, 
you know, why isn't he saying that that's the translation that should be used? Surface understanding. It, at this point, evaluating that this has more than one particular manner of looking at the whole situation has not entered the mind. Why is the Webster's 1828 on the Ellen White CD wrong? Does she endorse it? Does James White endorse it? No. And in this in this situation, here we're talking about something that is being used that was published 59 years after the 1769 authorized revised King James, the Oxford edition. So yeah. I Which I, I also have on eSword, by the way. Okay. I look at all of this, and this is another conclusion that is presented as it's needing to be accepted as fact. Mm -hmm. So... And, and, the, and, and, and obviously, an English word has more than one meaning. There's shades of meanings for every English word. Correct. Plus, the King James translators uh, sometimes would not have any understanding of a later meaning of a word uh, when they translated in 1611 or in 1769, right? Right. Um, even though you can say, well, Webster's is close to that date, um, you know, there's a lot of words they didn't change in the revisions that there are meanings, shades of meanings of that word that would never have a, a, even entered the mind of uh, the translators of the King James Bible in 1611. You know, and and even when you look at something like uh, the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Well, the word restore did not have the definition, the meaning that it has today. That is, you know, to rebuild it, right? To so so we take it as well. That's the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But the Hebrew shuv would have no no shade of meaning at all in the idea of fixing something up that was broken down, right? Now the Bishop's Bible says the return of the people the going forth of the commandment, the return of the people, and to build, right? So, you know, so you're going to lose that if you're using the King James, and even if you're using the Webster's Dictionary, you're going to miss what's actually in the Hebrew. In this so, particular situation, I believe that, that he's going back to a comment that had been made at a particular Bible study by a friend, who has passed to his rest because this particular friend who was quite astute was trying to make the point that we should be able to study the Bible as the pioneers had done without the need of Hebrew or Greek. Now okay. that's a, that, that's a great thought, but, just as we have been addressing in in relation to one particular word, vision, the translation into English has lacked greatly because in the 1611 and the 1769 editions that are published in English, it doesn't matter if we're seeing the calzone, the mara, or the mare vision, they're all placed as being the singular vision. And we have to pay extreme attention to note that there, there's actually at least three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, we would agree with Miller that we can understand the scriptures Without, without having a degree in divinity, being a doctor of divinity, right? I agree. Without knowing the original languages. And God can lead us. So one thing we know is that the Holy Spirit can lead a person to understand things 
And we see this in the Millerite movement. Did they understand the calendars when uh, did Josiah Litch, uh, when he made the prediction of August 11th, 1840? No. No, he didn't understand the book, but yet the biblical calendar witnesses to that date in multiple ways, right? And to each of the dates that he never even considers, you know, 360 years after, um, you know, another 30 years after that. Right? He doesn't he doesn't consider those events and those dates and the symbols of them. Um, and yet he arrives at the correct date. And so God in his providence can teach us things, even if we don't fully understand, you know, Hebrew or Greek or calendars or whatever, because God can lead, right? Even 457 BC, you know, it happens that the, the King James Bibles at that time had the date 457 BC for Artaxerxes' decree. But that wasn't the original date that's not the date that um, was held by Usher, right? So it's generally Usher's chronology, but Usher's going to, you know, have uh, the date of 467 for Artaxerxes' decree. And then Usher's going to use the second decree as the start of, that is, Nehemiah's decree as the start of the 70 weeks, right? So... So God, God has allowed things in a certain way to lead his people. He's led this movement when we didn't understand. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand. Agreed. Right. You know, because if you look at it this way, so God led the Millerites with, with the limits that they had within their limitations. But we don't have those limitations anymore. So why would you limit yourself? You know, it's like me saying, well, when I first started studying Adventism, I had to use books. I had, you know, my Thayer's lexicon, my Jesenius lexicon, my Strong's, my Young's, my Bible, and my three blue volumes of Spirit of Prophecy indexes and a scattering of Spirit of Prophecy books that I could afford at that time. Right. So I had maybe 20 Spirit of Prophecy books. Could God lead me at that time studying with those limited things? Yeah. So would I just still limit myself to those that material? Would I say, I, well, I, I studied without ESORD before I don't need ESORD? I think that God is giving us enough tools for us to be able to rightly divide the word of truth mm -hmm. and open our minds two points that we need to understand for this time in our history. Mm -hmm. And we understand way more than we did when we started studying. Let's say we go back to 2020 when we started in the, in April or whatever, doing these studies, I think it's April 4th, um, that we started uh, having regular studies. We can agree those are, that have followed we know way more about the scriptures and how to study than we ever knew before. Right. I think that's correct. Even of us, you know, that we're, we're really considered deep studiers. We realize how shallow our understanding was of the scriptures. And, you know, we need to be able to advance, but we also can trust that God can lead people who in, in amazing ways, Right. Now, that's the problem with our scholars is it's like, well, we're the scholars. We know everything. And so obviously, you know, poor peasants, you know, who are uneducated, there's no point even looking at anything they have to say because they're just ignorant. Right. They're not enlightened like we are. But we would never have that attitude about any sincere believer that God can lead them and give them insight. Right. We would never put ourselves above them just because we've studied so much. Right. You, you understand what I'm saying? God can teach the simplest of us. And and, and in a sense, we, we all are, are all simple. Right. right? You know, none of us are great intellectual minds. Right. We're, we're all just simple people who, you know, we have some peculiarities. Like I remember numbers. Um, 
but without the study of the scriptures, without obedience to God, none of that has any bearing on whether we're going to understand the truth. Intelligence has no bearing on whether someone is uh, correct in their belief, right? Correct. Okay. I know people who are not very intelligent, but can understand God's word, obey it, and have great insight. And I know some people are extremely intelligent and believe almost everything wrong, right? So, so education, learning, intelligence, they, they have a place, but they cannot replace um, obedience to God in understanding what is truth. But it doesn't mean that we should just say, well, I'm been there no value and I should just be ignorant. Right? Okay. So, you know what I'm saying? Like some people actually take pride in the fact that they're uneducated and that they can just, you know, God can just lead them directly and they don't really need to, to actually study and improve on their abilities. Ellen White was led of God. Did she continue to work at writing, becoming a better writer? Or did she just say, well, God, I'm God's prophet, so I'm just going to, you know, write what he shows me and, and uh, not worry about how I communicate that? No, she worked really, really hard in her understanding of studying the Bible and in how to write and communicate. Okay, Dwight, uh, our time's up. Yes, it is. Which the next topic is going to be the spirit of prophecy. So what we're going to have here, we're going to have the the following, which should be about a 10 to 15 minute conversation for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What follows is article number eight. Now, do we want to go back over article eight or do we jump to article 11? Well, we went through eight um we should just do a cursory uh review of some of the things we did before okay but just so you know we can say here's what what he talked about we had a discussion about it before and then you know we might be able to review all of those okay okay and that is a you know that's an interesting comment in the chat ellen white used historians to help in composing the great controversy and even read the daily mainstream newspapers. Nowadays, the MSM is terribly untrustworthy. So that's nowadays the mainstream media <clears throat> is terribly untrustworthy. And then there's a recollection that says, I can recall plenty of times God was leading me in my life, even before I accepted Christ and had been very rebellious and agnostic. Okay. Shall we now end our session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for showing us these areas and these items in our lives that we need to let loose of, to let you deal with. Help us today. Guide us in all that you would have us to do. Direct us, we pray, so that we may give glory to your name and to your character. Help us as we walk. Forgive us of our sins. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.